Understanding autofocus can be a daunting subject. We look through the viewfinder, press a button, and everything comes into focus. Magic, right? But how does this autofocus work, and why is it better on these new mirrorless cameras? I'm Terry Vanderheiden, and I've been working with the new Nikon Z9 for a few months now, and it has some awesome autofocus abilities. I'm gonna show you what I've learned about the Nikon autofocus system and kind of try to bring everything into focus for you. Okay, here's the video. There are two types of autofocus that we talk about here. First is contrast detection AF. This is where the camera uses contrast to help determine what's in focus under the focus point that you've selected in the viewfinder. The focus point is analyzed and then the data is sent to the lens to adjust the focus. While this works pretty well, except for when you don't have anything of contrast for the camera to lock onto. Let's say for instance, you're trying to take a picture of a blank sky. Not that there's any good reason to shoot a picture of the blank sky, other than of course checking your sensor for dust. But contrast detection works great when the subjects have strong horizontal and vertical lines. This allows the camera to lock onto the subject really quite quickly. The downside of this contrast detection AF is that it's more likely to lock onto horizontal and vertical lines, such as the vegetation or whatnot behind your subject. The other type of autofocus that's employed in today's cameras is phase detection AF. In this type of autofocus, tiny lenses are employed to split the light into a pair of images. The distance between these two images is measured and analyzed, and then the camera sends that information to the lens to grab the focus. Phase detection happens really fast, and that's why we can see such rapid results when we're using our autofocus. In our DSLRs, the AF sensor is positioned as a separate sensor that handles both phase and contrast detection at the same time. It's pretty cool technology, but the size of this autofocus sensor dictates how many points across our viewfinder that can accurately use the autofocus. The result is the DSLR will not give us as many options to pick focus points in our viewfinders. With the Z9 and many other new mirrorless cameras on the market, the AF sensor is built right into the imaging sensor, using both contrast and phase detection at the same time. This allows mirrorless cameras to have edge-to-edge -edge focus points, thus giving photographers much more flexibility in capturing what we want in focus. Choosing an autofocus mode. Working with the Nikon system, the most common mode to use in autofocus is AFS. This is a single area autofocus that is best used with static subjects. That's why I have it set to one of my function buttons on AFS so that I can quickly get a sharp focus in a small area while I'm creating images such as a landscape, things that aren't moving. However, as a wildlife photographer, AFC is a better choice as it continuously focuses on the subject that's under the active focus point. As the subject moves, so does the focus. The other mode that I use quite often is manual focus. Since I have my camera set up as continuous autofocus using the back button, as soon as I take my thumb off the back button, the camera is back in manual mode. That makes it pretty easy to switch to manual mode focus just by not pressing the back button autofocus button. Your new camera doesn't come set up that way. You have to change it from the shutter release button activating the autofocus. I have a video that steps you through how to set up back button focus on the Z9. You can check it out by clicking up here in the link or I'll put it in the description below. I use the back button assigned to focus mainly because I don't want the focus to change inadvertently when I press the shutter button. If I focus on something then recompose, the focus point is now somewhere else when I press the shutter. If I set it traditionally, then the shutter button will activate the focus and my focus would change at the last second and that could yield a poorly focused image. I'd rather have two functions work separately, the thumb for focus and the index finger for shutter release. Area modes. 
Next, you have to choose the area in which the camera will focus with. There are several to work with on the Nikon. Choosing the proper area that you want the camera's autofocus to be making its calculations at is critical to achieving razor sharp final images. And speaking of razor sharp, that happens to be the name of my new book, Razor Sharp Nature Photography. This ebook is available for instant download on my website, imagelight.com. The book shows you step by step how to get razor sharp wildlife and landscape images, from understanding depth of field all the way to post processing your images for that ultimate sharpness. This book covers everything you need to know about consistently getting razor sharp images. As with any purchase of my digital products, it helps me to afford to produce these videos and my podcast, The Nature Photography Podcast. I appreciate all the photographers who've already purchased my ebook, Razor Sharp, and thank you in advance for those who are motivated to purchase it today. I'll leave a link in the description that will take you right to the sales page. Thanks again. So here's the lowdown on area modes. To start with, there's pinpoint mode. This gives you the exact location of your focus point, which is really cool. When you have an accurate focus, the tiny little box turns green. However, it's only available in AFS, and it doesn't cover the entire viewfinder of the Z9. And you can't use pinpoint autofocus when your mode is set to continuous. But it's great for static images where you wanna choose that exact focus point. Next is a somewhat larger focus point, single point. While this box is a bit larger than the pinpoint, you can use it with continuous mode and it covers almost the entire viewfinder. As a quick tip, there's an autofocus button on the lower left side of the camera, right where you have all your in and out ports. It has some little texture bumps on it and when you press it, the thumb wheel will adjust the mode and the index finger on the front dial of the camera will adjust the area mode. This makes it fairly easy to bounce between focus modes and areas. The next area modes, Nikon has three different dynamic areas. They come in small, medium, and large. These have to be set in camera because that menu that I just told you about won't be able to flip to them as easily. These are different because the size you pick will be the space where you're choosing to focus. The camera then sees the thing that's closest to the camera inside that box and makes that sharp. Well, this can work and it's pretty fast, you can imagine that if you use a dynamic area of focus, that you're trying to focus on a bird's head, but the wing is included in that box, then the camera might focus on the wing and not on the bird's head because the wing is closer to the camera. Remember, in these modes, it's whatever's closest to the camera that gets focused on first. Also is true with the wide area AF. It's a selection dedicated to an area of the frame that you want to have focus in. In the newest firmware that was just upgraded, you have the access to build custom boxes so you can make and create long narrow boxes or horizontal boxes, whichever you're looking for, vertical and horizontal. While these boxes could work well with sports, I haven't figured out a way to use these for capturing wildlife. If you have a suggestion on how these are usable for wildlife photographers, leave it in the comment section below. Yet another autofocus mode to try would be the Auto Area AF. In this mode, the camera uses the whole frame and focuses on whatever is closest to the camera or the part of the image that has the highest area of contrast. Now that's relying on your camera to do quite a bit of work for you. Again, not that useful in most situations, but it's there if you want to try it. Lastly is the focus mode that I use for most of my wildlife photography. It's called 3D tracking. Along with the AF subjects detection options, this works pretty well with most wildlife photography. Here's how I use 3D tracking with animal eye subject detection. I went with a friend to some private property and photographed from blinds on this small pond. We had two blinds to choose from. One was a one person lay down blind that could get those really great water level shots. And the other was a standard two-person blind where you could sit in relative comfort in chairs and have long lenses snuggled down onto your tripods.
This is a fantastic way to shoot and also you can engage in some quiet conversation while you're waiting for the subjects to arrive. In this spot, we knew that wood ducks would show up every spring to pair up. The males were all decked out in their finest attire, so the photographic possibilities were there for the taking. The fact that this was private property made it even more special, as my buddy could set up the blinds well in advance. The wood ducks, using the pond as a dating site, would at some point get used to the blinds being there, and it wouldn't disrupt their day-to-day -day activities. I chose to use the 3D tracking with animal eye subject detection to capture the ducks in action. Using my 600 f4 lens fitted with a Z adapter, I would move the focus box over the head of the subject and then press the back button to start the autofocus. The camera would lock into the duck's eye, and if it moved, just pressing the shutter of the Z9 would yield me 20 frames a second. All I had to do was keep the duck in the frame and mostly let the camera do the work of tracking the movement and the focus. Understanding what 3D tracking is looking for is pretty important. Not that I wouldn't attempt to shoot subjects if the conditions weren't perfect, but knowing that 3D tracking is looking for, and it's looking for something in particular, is very important, and that is a color pattern. As you grab onto a subject, the camera will stay focused on that particular color pattern. In the case of the wood ducks, their eyes have a consistent pattern to them, and that's what the camera locks onto. The 3D autofocus would occasionally lock onto vegetation in the background, and again, it's looking for those vertical and horizontal lines, and I'd have to reassign the focus box back to the head of the duck. So it's not perfect, but it works most of the time. The next thing to consider is the predictable movement of your subject. This is where understanding the behavior of your subject can really pay off. After watching these wood ducks interact on a few occasions, we noticed that these birds would take off out of the pond. They shot straight up in the air where some other aquatic birds need to get a running or a flying start. These ducks would lift off kind of like helicopters. With that knowledge, we could leave some space above the bird, so if it looked like they were getting ready to move, this would allow us some space for the bird to take off. While I did take some static shots of the ducks navigating the pond, it was the action shots we were looking for. There were also some instances where the wood ducks would gather along an old fallen tree, and from there would take off right at us. They would drop down a bit and then climb into the sky. Knowing this makes it easier to track them. I would set the autofocus box on the eye and keep that back button pressed and ready to fire. When the birds moved, the camera would track the eye as far as we could before losing them. One of the downsides about using a blind is that it's hard to tell when the birds are coming in for a landing since you can't see up and around you very easily. We would usually be surprised when the wood ducks would fall from the sky and do their splashdown. Using a blind can be limiting in your movement, but many other critters also came to the pond to give us even more image-making possibilities. So that's how I used the 3D tracking with animal eye subject detection on the Z9 to capture moving wildlife. I encourage you to try the different autofocus modes and areas to see what works best for what you're doing. If you like this content, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, and then ring the bell to be notified of more videos like this. If you're looking for more nature photography content, check out my podcast, cleverly named The Nature Photography Podcast. It can be found on all the main podcasting sites, Apple, Spotify, Google, and others. Search for The Nature Photography Podcast. And remember to put in the in the title, and then look for the bald eagle logo. I'm Terry Vanderheiden, and thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. And kind of try to bring everything into focus for you. Oh, okay. Holy <laughs> Hang on. It's okay, he's going to be in the background, maybe? Maybe? Cue the pig. And there goes a pig in the background.